song that will get your heart rate up. Every time I sing the word up, reach for the stars. Every time I sing the word down, touch the ground. The rest of the time, march with your knees high. Those magnificent men in their flying machines, they go up to the up, up, they go down to the down, down. They enchant all the ladies and see all the scenes with their up to the up, up, and they're down to the down, down. Up and down, flying around, looping the loop and defying the ground. Up and down, they're frightfully keen. They can fly upside down with their feet in the air. They don't think of danger, they really don't care. Uh -uh. Newton would think he had made a mistake yeah. to see those young men and the chances they take. Those magnificent men in the Well, hello, and welcome to the Powell River Airport. Columbia, Canada. Home of the Westview Flying Club and new home of the home built seaplane that I call the Spirit of Mackenzie. So my name's Robert. Robert Grantham. And just to clarify the confusion right now, no, I don't live in Downton Abbey. I'm not a lord. I'm not the Earl of Grantham. I'm not that Robert. But if that Robert would like to have a beautiful lawn ornament for his estate, he better speak up fast because this 90% built plane is going to soon change its status from lawn ornament to flying beauty. My mission over the next three months is to complete the build, one month of testing, two months of general aviation flying around the local area, and maybe put her to sleep in her hangar for the winter season. Good day, eh? Welcome to the great wet north. I bet you thought I was gonna say great white north. Well, this is Western Canada, so uh, great wet north is more appropriate, eh? What do you think, hoser? How's it going, eh? My name's Bob. This is Dog. And down here we got the Spirit of Mackenzie. So we're like uh, Bob and Dog Mackenzie, eh? Get it? <laughs> How's it going, eh? So, our topic today. What's our topic today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah come on. Our topic today is movie locations. Why, eh? Well, because it's confusing. And uh, like we're making this video, so we think we're kind of like um, movie experts, eh? <laughs> right on. So, movie locations. So, a lot of movies are made in Canada, but many of them are made by Americans. Yeah. So, how do you tell the difference between an American movie and a Canadian movie made in Canada? Well, if it's an American movie, then you're going to see American postal boxes, uh, police cars with American crests on the side, American flags everywhere. So in the first few minutes, if you see a lot of Americana stuff, then that's an American movie, but it's made in Canada because they're trying to set their audience's mind at ease that their expensive movie that they went in to watch on uh, Netflix is uh, not some cheap thing made in some you know developing country like Canada. You know? so, but Canadians, if it's a Canadian movie and it's made in Canada, then there'll be Canadian stuff everywhere. Canadian hats, Canadian flags, Canadian beer, Canadian back bacon, you know, uh, Canadian dogs. Hey, you're from Slovakia. How'd you get on this set? We must be paying you a lot to be here. Anyway, hey, so, uh, so that's the topic. I hope you understood that. I was pretty confused, but I think dog got it. Now from back here, she might look 100% built, ready to go flying right now. But I can assure you that there's enough missing to constitute that 10% that she hasn't got a hope getting off the ground for three months. So let's take a closer look and see what I have yet to build. 
you can see that she's a seaplane as opposed to a float plane because she lands on that boat-like hull. And she's got those two main wheels, one on each side, which swing up out of the way to make sure that that water landing is possible. Inside the cockpit, you can see that there's two places, pilot on the left, co-pilot, passenger on the right, both of whom have enough controls to fly the plane. So you can see all sorts of hoses, tubes, wiring hanging loose. So the wiring harness is 90% built. You can see that the Lexan windshield is missing, the sliding cockpit covering, and the little windows that go around the baggage compartment. The fuselage and the wings are not painted. The actuators for the wheels, which are located behind this seat, have yet to be finalized. Let's say 90%. Why not? It's a good round number. Seems to be very popular in this video so far. The engine is mounted and the prop is mounted, but there's about 10% more work to do before we can start the engine and check the pitch of the blades on the propeller. You can see perhaps that there's some cabling yet to be secured. So that's all part of the control services and controls, 90% built. Oh, 90%. Yeah, I think you can see. To get to the 90%, I've put about 1,000 hours of time. That's hands on the tools actually assembling the plane. Doesn't include all the time that has gone into sitting on the computer, on forums, asking questions, on the phone, asking questions, buying material, getting organized. Anybody that tells you it's 600 hours to build a kit like this is... Uh, off by I'd say 50%. So at 90%, a thousand hours, I need another 100, 200 hours. I'm just gonna take me about 1200 hours before I can say the build is done. Okay, so out at the hangar, you've just seen what I claim is 90% of a, of a plane and 10% of the remaining life of a lawn ornament. So how much material and parts still have to be installed to make the plane a plane. Well, There's not a whole lot. All the parts that are remaining, other than nuts and bolts, are laid out here. Over the last few years, I've traveled around the world with my family, living and working in a lot of countries, and television hasn't always been an option because a lot of the programs are not in English. Uh, so I've taken to watching a lot of YouTube videos, and over the last couple of years, I've built up quite a stable of uh, YouTubers that I watch regularly, that I uh, subscribe to, click on like uh, almost all the time and I sponsor you know, through Patreon or Cafe or, or PayPal and one of my favorites is the Wildlings. The Wildlings are a young couple currently in the south of France in a boatyard struggling to rebuild a catamaran that they've kind of tongue-in-cheek called the Beast and Mark has uh, acknowledged that they lack project management skills. I thought that was pretty pretty good for a, a young fella struggling the way they are right now to know what he doesn't know. Yeah, they know how to make up task lists and strike off jobs when they get them done. But what they're finding is they don't have the material when they want to do the task, or they don't have the money when they want to buy the material. They're always up against a timeline. And these are important aspects of project management that I've learned about over my last 40 years of being a project manager. And in this series of videos that I'm going to produce for you, I'm going to hit on some aspects of project management and how to apply them to a difficult project like building a plane, like rebuilding a sailboat, like maybe sailing around the world, like many of the YouTubers I follow are doing. Um, so thank you, Mark, uh, for pointing out 
that this is something I can share with my audience. And Siasia, uh, me and you, Nadiana, O Jiao Lobota, O Liza Janada. So the project management process, as laid out by the Project Management Institute, uh, which certifies project management professionals, a certificate I also plan in this six months of my project to obtain, among other things. They lay out a process of how to manage a project, and it can be uh, broken down into a few phases. First, you're going to initiate the project. Then you're going to plan the project. How many fingers do I have? Then you're going to execute the project. You're going to control and monitor it, and you're going to close it out. So five process areas for managing a project. First off, the initiation. In the initiation, you set up what's called the project charter, and you find out who your stakeholders are. The project charter, which I'll get into in the next episode, basically lays out what is the project, who's in charge, the overall budget, the overall scope, and the overall schedule. But a really important aspect of it is who are the stakeholders? Who are all the people that can affect the project positively or negatively and are either going to benefit or lose from the project? So they're going to be there, whether you like it or not, either right inside your space or outside your space uh, with suggestions and demands and concerns and support and resources. These are your stakeholders. So for this project, you, my friend, are one of my stakeholders. And I really encourage you to uh, send a comment, an email, uh, as we go along, and exercise your right as a stakeholder. Okay, so launching this project management initiative. Next episode, we'll talk in more detail about the project charter. Another YouTube site I follow and support is Gone with the Winds, a sailing couple from Texas, currently in the South Pacific on their catamaran. I was delighted to see them supporting an island ukulele group, so I'm hooking them up now with another Texas YouTube site, the Austin Ukulele Society. A little bit wild and windy and woolly. One, two, one, two, ready. The plane is uh, well strapped down. Water up towards the pulp and paper mill at the north end of the old town site, up to the Salish Sea, Harwood Island, across to Vancouver Island, about 20 miles distance, Texada Island. And there's a little fishing float at the end of the breakwater, and then this is Willington Beach, basically right in the center of Westview. It's got a campground. Picnic ground, sandy beach. This is where I learned to swim in the salt water as a little tyke. I had my first lesson in independence and what to do or not to do when you hurt yourself. Cut my foot open on an oyster, or maybe it was a rusty tin can, I don't know, waiting in the water here. Had to get myself home hitchhiking, and mother took me to the hospital. Doctor sutured me up, and I swear without anesthetic. Because my story to my mother was how much it hurt, and that's why I bawled and cried, and she told me to be a man, and I had a pain-killing shot, no reason to be so upset. It wasn't until a couple years later when I cut my finger open, making a spearfishing harpoon, that I had to go to emergency again with my mother, and this time the Novocaine shot took successfully, and I triumphantly told my mother, See, Mom, that time it didn't hurt. That time I had a shot. Not like that other time when you called me a baby. This is Powell Lake, located just to the north of the Powell River Historical Town Site and uh, just a short distance from the Powell River Airport and will most likely be the place that the Spirit of Mackenzie will have its first water landing. You can see there's a small aerodrome here, a windsock, a 
There's a float plane down there tied up to the wharf. I remember as a child coming down here and playing on that beach, finding an old oil can that had been opened the old fashioned way with a triangular opener. Sticking my finger in the hole and throwing that oil can out into the water, as kids will do. And with the oil can, a chunk of my finger went. Lesson to be learned there. Don't stick your body parts where they don't belong. Anyway, this is a long lake, about 30 miles long. It's quite deep. In fact, it was initially formed as a fjord. It's part of the ocean. And when the Ice Age was over, 10 or 20,000 years ago, and the land rose back up again after the weight of the ice was gone, some of the salt water was trapped. And it's still in the lake. And as the rainwater filled the lake up, and then a dam was built, about a hundred years ago and filled the lake to its current level it's retained some of that salinity there's about 200 float houses up the lake and they all are initially built right here and then pulled up the lake by a barge and uh, I'm really looking forward to flying up the lake to visit some of these float houses my brother being one of them, and a few interesting characters who live up the lake year round. Hi, Sammy. Don't you look cute? How are you doing? Okay, so in addition to building this plane and learning to fly it, I'm going to take on a few other challenges. I'm going to reacquire some life skills. Back when I was a teenager, I knew how to play the bagpipes, and those are the pipes. I played many, many years ago. Haven't touched them in 35 years or more. Don't know if I can still play them. In fact, I couldn't really play them even when I played them. I was basically a filler. I just filled in the back ranks of the marching band, which I was pretty good at, wearing the uniform, and uh, doing my best, struggling with the bagpipe. Now, many people may think this is a lost skill that is better left lost. I don't think so. I'm looking forward to trying again. And my aim is that by the end of this six months building this airplane, I'll also have relearned how to play the bagpipes. A typical factory built Sea Ray. So one of the things we're gonna have to do in this series is come up with a paint scheme. Now here's one I came up with a few years ago, actually prior to 2017, which was the uh, 150th birthday of Canada's Confederation using the logo which I got permission from the bureaucrats in Ottawa to use and a paint scheme that followed on from the logo anyway didn't make that deadline so we're gonna develop another one another paint scheme. in addition to building the plane and then flying the plane after it's built there's an intermediate period that is absolutely critical which is the testing and the testing of the plane is done, at least initially, by a qualified test pilot. And I've come to the conclusion that that won't be me. First of all, I'm very inexperienced at flying. I only have about 160 hours. Currently, I don't even have a pilot license, let alone a seaplane endorsement. Those are other tasks I'm gonna carry out in this period of time, uh, but that's a different topic. So I need a test pilot. In each episode of this series, I'm going to bring up a, a name, hopefully helped by suggestions uh, from you, of who could be the test pilot. And this is a very critical job. It takes someone with a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, the right attitude. Uh, ideally, has tested a sea ray before, but if not a sea ray, at least a seaplane, and if not a seaplane, at least a tail dragger. Um, but at least has test pilot experience. Uh, after the initial hour, say five hours by the test pilot, I would plan that I would then uh, complete the testing period of, which has to amount to about 60 hours of solo testing of the plane before I can take a passenger. So join me in finding a test pilot. Look forward to your uh, suggestions. I just need to extend the train. Okay, very good. 
scene one, take one of our never-ending video series. Cut! <laughs>